Okay. okay. And am I lit well enough? I can turn on yeah, another light. It is good. Okay. Yes. Good morning. How are you? Good. Let me move Santa Claus out of the back too. I didn't. Uh, <laughs> I keep moving him back and forth when I get on calls. <laughs> My daughter put a mask and sanitizer oh, and everything. <laughs> Santa has to abide by the COVID protocols as well. All right, I look professional. Yes, that's good. All right. Okay, so let's just dive right in. How did you get into sports psychology? So um, I didn't even know it existed and I was a high school runner and I really could have used it um, because for those that run, you know that that's a lot of time to be left alone with your thoughts. <laughs> and um, it was the last class I took in college, it was an elective. I always knew I wanted to be a psychology, a psychologist, psychology major. I read Freud for fun in sixth grade, analysis of dreams, I was that kind of guy. Um, and then I took this class and it's like my whole world opened up. I was like, this is a thing. And I immediately said, this is what I wanna do. So I'd already been locked into psychology and still wanted to help people with you know, pathology and disorders. But from that point forward, I was like, well, I definitely want to concentrate on sport as well. And I wanted to get the spectrum of how do you achieve excellence? Because that's not normal um, in the same way that pathology isn't normal, but we don't want to live in that middle. But I also knew that athletes were human beings. So I continued on with clinical psychology because um, I want to understand the whole person, but then also got specialty training in sports psychology, understanding that there was a whole different psychology to excellence and uh, we needed to master that as well. So can you go through your education background? Sure. And then what made you want to pursue a PhD? Yeah, well, it's, I, I laugh because, well, I wanted to get a PhD because it was the highest and the hardest. Like that's honestly what it was like. So competitive nature right from the beginning. I always loved sports, but honestly, I was never good at it. I wasn't good at sports. I didn't come from an athletic family. My father was an immigrant, um, didn't even know what football was and things. Um, but I'd always just loved the physicality of sport and enjoyed it. So when I went to school, um, as I told you, by, I wanted a major in psychology. So I went to Binghamton University. Back then it was SUNY Binghamton in uh, upstate New York. And uh, right away knew I wanted to be a psychology major and stuck with it. Um, and uh, then I got turned on to sports psychology at the end of that. And then I went to, uh, I just knew I wanted to go all the way. So I went to the Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago in their, psych their graduate uh, psychology programming for clinical um, because there was a guy there who also um, had a background in sports psych so I knew I could be able to do both at the same time. And I didn't get a master's, like I fulfilled all the requirements of it but there was no terminal master's. So that was kind of cool where I didn't have to stop and reapply. So we just went in, did my master's thesis, went back to class and just kept going. <laughs> um, and then after that, uh, I did some internships and one of, or rather some practicums. One of them was at the um, uh, Chronic Pain and Rehabilitation Center in Chicago. Um, so I went on an internship in Virginia at the Salem VA um, in Roanoke, Virginia. And then when I came back, I did a postdoc in pain rehabilitation at that same practicum. Um, and I really st stuck with that because with my clinical, I had said, well, what are the things that athletes will suffer from the most? So what do I want to be good at? And I was like, well, everybody gets injured. So I spent a lot of time in specialty in, in pain and injury rehabilitation. Um, and then did some things with substance use and disordered eating, um, as well as the general depression and anxiety. Um, and then I got asked certified um, soon after that. So I actually had to go back to, back to uh, college with my PhD and I had to take two undergrad classes to fulfill the requirements <laughs> that I got missed out. Um, but then I became asked certified pretty soon after that. Can you walk us through the, the steps it took to get ASP certified? Um, well, they're different now. Um, so there's, it, again, back in the day, it's we were piecing a, things together. It's a lengthy process. It, it is now, but it's really so, much, so worth it now, too, because, I mean, we needed to establish credibility. You know, we needed to you know, protect the public and, and give students and practitioners guidance. Because, um, again, when I started this like 20 plus years ago, you know, people were doing it, I don't wanna say we were still making it up, but honestly, there weren't all the sports psych programs that are out there now, like with this curriculum. Um, so I was in a clinical program, but everything I was reading for, I got Christmas books, where it's like, you know, psychology of injury and psychology of, you know, disabled athletes and, you know, eating disorders in athletes. And I was, a lot of it was self-education. I took my, my classes, like for behavioral observation, I did it on overtraining in athletes. For my disability clinical class, I did it on wheelchair athletes. 
my dissertation was on competition and or the effect of competition on acute pain tolerance. So there was a way that we had to kind of pull it together at the beginning. Now I don't have the the details of the requirements memorized, but if you go to the Association for Applied Sports Psychology website, AppliedSportsPsych.org, um, you'll find it listed. But it's got some core classes on the clinical and the counseling skills that you would need at a basic level. You've got the basic exercise sciences and, and sports psychology skills that you need to be trained in, as well as ethics and diversity. Um, a fair amount of theory, which is good. You need to ground your techniques into the theories. And then you need those 400 hours of supervised uh, mentorship, which can be incredibly valuable. Um, and so I serve as a mentor now too, as well. So I've been able to jump on the other side and help people who want to get certified by being a mentor. Um, you don't get through tele. Um, doesn't have to be in person anymore. So we're adapting. Um, but it's those 400 hours of uh, mentorship that's uh, incredibly valuable where we can problem solve cases and I can get to watch you work and, and give feedback. A lot of growth happens there. Can you talk us through the process of moving your business into telehealth? Because with COVID, I mean, it's very difficult to, to meet in person. And especially if you're doing something so applied, how do you consult with the athlete and make sure that you're on the same page if you're not right in front of each other? Yeah. Um, and actually, I forgot one huge thing. We have a certification exam now, too. I forgot to mention that. That's a big deal. Um, that's relatively new in the last five or so years. Um, and so I think that adds a lot of credibility as well, too, that we have to actually take a test on the field. So um, that's exciting. But the switch to telehealth, yeah, it's, um, you know, I was always, always for a long while, I've done like one or two clients if, you know, there's some distance or something like that. And it always worked out fine. But COVID has really just made it where everybody's really okay with it in much the same way that people, you know, don't mind if their kids are in the background or the dog is barking in a presentation. You know, people just kind of accept that. But we do have to be careful because without it being face to face, there are a couple things that you want to be sure that you're still giving the quality and the attention and being able to get the details that you need. So I would say for the most part, um, it goes, it's going pretty well, particularly for things like psychological skills training, um, where I'm doing more of the coaching and they're, um, they're teaching lessons. Um, I ask them to do certain things like, you know, treat it like it's an office. So, you know, can they be sure that the door is closed and so they know that family knows that, you know, nobody's going to be in there searching for scissors or whatever else that they might need in the desk. Um, you know, ask them to put their phones down, shut them off so that they're not, you know, picking them up and kind of distracted. And you'll always see that. Um, get rid of the pets. Sometimes they'll have their dog in their lap and be distracting and yelling at the dogs. And so you really try to create it so that you have an office environment. And when you can do that, you can do that pretty well. And then I'm careful to ask them to center themselves, you know, like we're centered here, where you can kind of see as much as you can. Because sometimes I'll get them kind of like this and you can't see what they're doing or, or they're, you can't really read their body language or, you know, they'll start drifting off to the side. And then it's like you're losing a lot of information. Um, and then what is that body language even telling you? So I think the concerns are, um, and I've been fortunate, you know, like how, how severe the pathology might be, you know, if they're suicidal, you know, there are things like that that you want to kind of be careful and say, you know, is a telehealth practice, if they have the option, the best for them, um, you know, are you going to be able to, to, to read and intervene um, in, in some of those cases? So um, it's, it's not perfect, but it's a lot better than before we had tele and you try to do things over the phone or, um, and I think for athletes in particular, what's nice and that they've appreciated is uh, the, the decreased travel time. So I'd have some athletes drive an hour to see me for 45 minutes and drive an hour back. And in between school and homework and practice, you know, that got to be pretty challenging. So the availability for athletes um, has, is easy. And a lot of the young ones are pretty comfortable with technology anyway. But I think as consultants, it's up to us to be sure that the quality stays there. And for, for those not interested in consulting with you one-on-one, -on -one, can you talk about your mental toughness in 60 seconds oh, process? Sure. Yeah. Um, well, it's always been very important to me to, like what we do isn't rocket science. I wish I could say it was. I mean, I went to school for a really long time to learn it and stuff. But I think if we're doing it well, we can translate it into small bite-sized chunks or, or principles that I would love to be teaching to third graders, fifth graders, certainly by high school. And so with that in mind, 
to have an impact, which is really my big, big goal, like to, to improve the world, to improve the mental health of, of the population, athletes and other high performers. I, I was like, well, how do I kind of do this at the same time educating people about what sports psychology is and does? So four years ago, I started making these one minute videos, honestly, because that's all at the time Instagram allowed. Um, but I also figured now good for attention but mental toughness in 60 seconds. So it's free. It's, I just post it on my social media and in my newsletter and it's a different obstacle and how to overcome it uh, once or twice a week. And so I've got like 150 videos on YouTube and, and other things like that. And I just keep putting it out because um, the feedback has been fantastic of, Oh, wow. You know, yeah, that's, that's a great point. I try to make them extremely practical. They're always based on, you know, research and sound principles or experiences. Um, but it's really, I just try to take one problem and solve it at a time with uh, the very same strategies that I'll use with an athlete or high performer in my sessions. Um, but a nice digestible one minute. Sometimes I go in more than 60 seconds, like three minute or uh, so with some of the COVID stuff, I've just you know made like a five minute video, but really rarely longer than that. Um, and so that's, yeah, that's just been fun. Something I've done for a few years and plan to keep doing. So when you are meeting in person how do you know how to consult with a sport that you've never played so say you have a gymnast come in and say okay i'm i'm rehabbing from injury i had i broke my ankle or something and i'm i'm on the beam and i need help regaining that confidence to do a backflip and land yeah how, what do you tell her and how do you work through those issues modesty like and this is with everybody, even in sports that I do know, because even in psychology with the stuff that I might know, like the idea is, first of all, the athlete knows themselves the best. So if I start mind reading or I start guessing, um, even when it seems and looks really familiar, that's a dangerous point because my first job is to listen and understand who this person is, where they're at and what they're feeling and trust that. So I may have seen it like performance anxiety a bazillion times before but that doesn't mean I understand the way she's experiencing it. And so then if you get to a point where it's a sport that I don't understand, it's really about roles. It's like, I am not supposed to be a coach. I am not a coach. So again, even if it's in CrossFit or football or something that I, I know well and enjoy, like I shouldn't be giving any coaching advice. At, the, at, at, at best, it might just be in conflict with the coaches telling them, even different coaches in the same sport have different philosophies, but it's a dual relationship and it's not my place, it's not my lane. I'm an expert in the mental game, in the emotional. And so that's what I know. But the athlete knows herself and she knows her sport the best. And so I always come together as a partnership. And I got, I got my stuff, you got your stuff. And if we work together as equals playing our roles, then we can get you where you wanna go. And so I find it actually very easy to consult with something that I've never done before. Um, and sometimes it's fun to hear about. I've done like dog agility. I've done roller derby, um, like some pretty fun stuff. Uh, the jujitsu and, and things like that. Like, I don't, I don't know those things um, to, to, to hear and learn. And I'll, I'm modest. I'm like, hey, how about doing this? They're like, oh, no, that'll never work. I don't have that five seconds. Okay. You know, we'll have to change the routine to adapt it. So everything I'm offering are always suggestions because it's up to the athlete to test it and tell me if it works. Like we've got great science, but not everybody's created equally. So that back and forth works really well. Um, and I found that you know, most, most people, they don't, they don't mind because they're coming to me for the mental game. They're not coming to me for coaching. So I, hopefully I'm like, you can find a better coach, you know, go, go somewhere else for that. And they appreciate that. <laughs> so what's the difference? You are, you are talking about letting the coach be the coach and letting you be the mental, the mental side of the game. Yeah. How do you work through that when you're the juxtaposition of working with an athlete versus working with a team? How, how impactful do you allow the coach to be or the parents to be in the situation of you working with a youth athlete in cultivating that relationship with their sport and the mental game, the combination of the two? Yeah. So let me rephrase the question so everyone understands yeah. it. How do we all get along? <laughs> Essentially, and how much of an impact do you let the parents or the coaching staff be on your, your implementation for them? Okay. Um, I would choose the words carefully and say, how much do I let them? I'm like, well, they're the parents, so they own the kid. So, 
And, you know, that's their athlete. And I don't have any authority on the baseball field or football field or basketball court. So um, I don't know that I've ever really gotten into a power struggle of any kind. Now, what I do offer the athlete is like, you can invite in the people that need to be invited in, or we can keep them out if you need the confidentiality and privacy. So I've done everything from just working with the athlete and um, nobody really knows, and they take what they learn and then they, they bring it and they let me know what's going on at home or with the parent or with you know, the coach in particular, and how do I deal with that? Um, I've had others then sign in a release form where I can talk with them. And um, I remember one of my football players was like, can we just have the coach come in? And so we had a coach on a conference call at another athlete where the coach came in. And it was interesting to get two different perspectives because the coach was saying one thing, the athlete was saying the other. And I was almost doing like couples therapy of trying to figure out how's the dynamic. And I do that a lot with parents. Um, my first sessions, I like to have parents in because particularly the younger the child, um, the younger the athlete, um, the less they're able to kind of give words to what's going on or what they want to get out of it. Um, and some of those, honestly, then I end up working with the parents. I remember one player I had where I told the kid, I was like, you're fine, but mom, you know, do you want to work together? <laughs> Cause she was her anxiety and was projecting it onto the kid and was making him nervous. And he was, she was nagging him and he was running away. And, and I was like, I think he's okay, but you seem pretty anxious about this. And we worked together for, for uh, a couple of months um, and just went into her stuff. So I think it'd be very particular for, uh, for adolescent athletes and even college kids if, if there's a dynamic there to have some contact with the parents because that's the bubble they live in. And uh, there's some dynamics going on there that I like to observe. You know, are the parents complimentary or are they nagging? Are they critical? Um, is there tension? Are the kids sitting there not looking? Are the kids able, when I ask them a question, does the parent answer? So those are all things in the first session when a parent is there, I like to observe for myself. Yeah. So when, you, when you're meeting with a new athlete, a new client, what are the things that stick out to you in that initial, hi, this is, this is who I am. This is what my name is. Um, this is what sport I play. This is the issue I'm having. What are some things that trigger in your mind? Okay, this is where we'll start. Um. Well, I always end it with sort of that question. Like after they tell me everything, I'm, I'm kind of getting my ideas. I'm looking for the idea of, you know, like similar to my, my, my thing, right? What's the obstacle that's getting in the way? So I, I kind of find out, well, what does sport mean to them? I'm looking for how much of an athlete, athletic identity they have, how important is sport to them? In my experience, what I find is that the ones that really, really care the most, particularly if they're coming for anxiety, it often comes out of how much they care and they just want to do well. And then that's different than, um, you know, if sport is just something that they do and they've got clinical issues outside of that. So I'm trying to kind of identify how much of this is sport related or sport context or athletic identity versus general. Um, many of them will go along this line that they're coming in with performance issues. So then I branch it out and say, well, is it the environment? Again, I check out about the coaching and the teammates and the dynamics. Is it about you know, personal expectations, perfectionism? So these are some of the big categories that I'm, I'm looking for as it goes through. And then I end up at the end, uh, I say, is there anything that I haven't asked that you think I should know? Because maybe I haven't asked all the questions. Um, and most of the time we cover it, but once in a while they'll tell me some big thing that, oh, okay, didn't know about that. Um, and I'll clarify, you know, are we looking, to, are you looking to feel better or are you looking to play better? And that really sets up the way that I intervene because my philosophy coming from an acceptance and commitment therapy background is that, you know, life is suffering. You know, bad things happen. And if we're looking to always feel good, you know, we're going to really be in trouble. We have four basic human emotions, happy, mad, sad, and scared. So three of those are negative. And if we're trying to live in that 25% of what it means to be human, we're always going to struggle. And sport in and of itself is a place of competition. Somebody is going to lose. It is going to be hard. You, as we said at the beginning, you can't be excellent and not sacrifice and, and be weird or different. You know, if you want to do and be in the top 3%, you have to be able to do what 97% of other people can't or won't do. That's not normal. And so you have to be able to develop this willingness and embrace this. So I'm setting them up in that first session to kind of find out, look, are you here to just feel better? Because if that's the case, we can do that. But that may or may not let you play better. And we typically think, well, I have to think positively and feel confident so that I can play better. And so right away, I'm starting to smash that because that's not true. We've all played well when we didn't feel like it. It's harder, 
Like if you're thinking positively, don't stop. But we've, we've done well when we've doubted and we've overcome it. And that's the thing that I really want to figure out how they master. So I want to set that up. Are you here for emotional relief? Because I can make you feel better, but you may not play better. Or really, do you want to improve your skills? And are the emotions the things that are actually getting in the way? And then I set up our consults in that way because the target is on playing better. And so we'll have to kind of continue to revisit that this is about performance. This is about behavior. So let's learn to interact with our thoughts and feelings differently. It's not about curing them. Again, 25% of it feels good. It's about interacting with that other 75% in a way that helps us and doesn't hurt us. And so if they're on board with that, then that kind of sprouts out that direction that will go. And if they're younger and they've never heard of sports psychology, maybe that's all way too complicated. And I could just go back to the psychological skills training. I, I did that, unfortunately, with a young 12 year old. If you, if you want to hear a story, kid comes in, I'm all excited about all this mindfulness and, you know, you know, you know diffusing from your, your thoughts and I'm teaching this kid this thing. And I do this exercise or I have people say, like, I can't pat my head and say that for a minute. And you realize that there's a disconnect between your actions and your, and your words. So that you practice that and you're supposed to, or the idea is, is that you start to learn that, whoa, what I think doesn't match up with what I say, right? I can say I'm a female and I'm, I'm not, I'm a male. And so you say, oh, I, I can't drink my coffee as you're drinking it. And you're like, whoa, these words don't mean anything. Well, anyway, long story short, the kid goes up to bat. He's thinking, I can't hit the ball. I can't hit the ball. He breaks into tears. Mom calls me up. It's like, I'm not bringing him back. This isn't working. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm sorry. I'm like, look, I got way ahead of myself. Give me another chance. Um, my error, right? I was totally into this delivery. I've been doing it with so many, it was working well, but the kid was 12. I just taught him how to breathe, taught him how to focus on the ball and taught him some imagery skills and he crushed it. Like I just made it, made it way too complicated. So sometimes people don't need all of that. And that's what I mean going back to the beginning about the importance of listening to who's in front of you. Like I've been in practice now long enough after 20 years. It's like, I, I know what I know and I know what I don't know that I can refer out. But really early on, before I had a professional athlete come in, I remember I grabbed my textbooks and before he came in, I opened up and I was looking because I wanted to review my notes of everything I'd learned in graduate school. <laughs> it was crazy, but I did it for the first three pro athletes that came in because I got so nervous. And it turned out they were just, they're, they're people. And, and, they, and, and they, I gave them the most basic interventions that helped tremendously. And I learned, thank goodness, in my first year, just be present and listen to what they're saying. And I'll either come up with the best answer or I won't know, and then I'll go find out. But listen to them. And it sounds ridiculous saying it right now because it's so basic, but shoot, even sports psychologists, we can get in our own way sometimes. So say you have an athlete who's come in, he or she is rehabbing from injury and athletic identity is huge. And they haven't been playing for yeah. weeks or months, or maybe they even took a year off if it was a season ending injury. What's the process of getting them back into the mindset to compete at an elite level? Yeah. Um, I kind of have two different answers there. So guide me if I don't hit your question right. So when I work with athletic identity, there was a period of time that particularly with teens and for my perfectionists and the anxiety that I found that that was really the big issue because if you were defined by what you do, that's a lot of pressure. You know, your batting average starts to define your worth and people are never really going to say that because they don't really process it that way, but it becomes pretty evident. Like when no win is enough, like when I have my athletes that they, they win, you know, uh, say state, but, now they've got to win regional and then they've got to be national champion and they don't ever really celebrate that it's because they have to keep winning to keep earning their worth and that becomes so much pressure and it can lead to burnout and so it's a matter of of finding different ways to help them shift from hey you're more than what you do and now that intervention will be different according to everybody i, I think that those who are spiritual it's about reconnecting to that as a, a child of god and that these are the talents that he's given you to use and so we might have a discussion like that again you know, according to their faith, not, not mine. Um, another big one is, is switching to values. You know, if you're always sort of the result, if your identity is a basis of all the goals that you achieve, you have to keep achieving goals and failure means you're not good enough. But what about the things that are under your control, like your values? If you identify as a uh, strong, hardworking, honest person, well, you could do that whether you're playing your sport or not. You could still be that person. 
and you could bring that person into the adversity of a loss or an injury. So how do you attack, how would that person attack their injury rehabilitation? And you're, you're still an athlete when you're injured. So an athlete is also kind of a mindset. You know, I hope that, you know, you and everybody who's listening, if you're an athlete now, that you're an athlete when you die. You might be playing very differently. You know, you might be walking a mile <laughs> at, you know, 90 um, or doing six push-ups. But, like, I want to be that person. You know, I want to play the long game because there's an athletic mindset. Right? I mean, we know that athletes are different. We lean into pain. We want things hard. Competition is fun. And to be a great athlete, you have to be able to also appreciate that. And, and if your identity is all wrapped up in just the winning, well, I don't know that that's really an athlete mindset. Because every athlete I've ever met has lost. Now, you don't have to like it, but you do have to learn from it and understand that it's an integral part of the process. So going back to that idea of athletic identity, I think maybe changing what it means to be an athlete can not only help with the injury rehabilitation or the, the distress that they might be having, but simultaneously when you, you, you come to terms with and can appreciate and value mistakes as part of the learning process, then that changes it. And so then if that's what your athletic identity means, then we keep your athletic identity. If not, you know, then we got to spread it out and realize because God forbid you have a catastrophic career ending injury. Um, you are more than what you do. And that's more than, you know, the grades that you get. It's more than the body that you're in and how good looking you might or might not be, how much money you make. I mean, we can put a lot of things into our identity that are outside here and they will all fail us at some point. Somebody will always be better, have more money, be skinnier, be heavier, be taller. So I listen very carefully to find out what do we, what do we have ourselves grounded in and can we raise it to a higher level? Um, again, either the spiritual or at least into the values and the things that we can control in the quality of person that we are. Yeah. I mean, athletics and sports as a whole are such a microcosm of society because you bring your values and you bring your goals into sport and then you, you superimpose them onto goals or um, touchdowns, things that are very sport oriented. And then you, you almost like, move your mindset to sport where it was working perfectly fine outside of sport and there's a disconnect. Yeah. And you really would love that synergy because sport can be a great metaphor for life. Um, and people say that like, Oh, sport, sport builds character. And it's like, well, it kind of reveals it because yeah. in, in our line of work, I've seen a lot of sport experiences that haven't been positive. So I don't think that there's anything inherently good or bad about sport. Um, it's what we bring to it. It's the people that are in it. It's the kind of coaching that we're getting or receiving, you know, because abuse happens in sport and, you know, people can, you know, win at all costs. And those are things that, you know, may not be helpful in your marriage. <laughs> um, now, again, there's also things that we realize that some things work, you know, in sport that don't work here. Like you can be very aggressive on a football field, but as soon as you step off the football field, you can't hit people like that, you know? And, we want to understand that there, there's a context as well too. So it's, um, there are times to separate them, but ultimately you're still the same person. And um, there's a lot of things about when you're excelling in sport and you're doing it well, um, that can really serve as a great way to be of character. And again, that can be who you are and you can do that. And when you retire from sport, you can apply that to your family, to your job, you know, to, to, to rehabilitation. There is that athletic mindset of mental toughness being better and more consistent than your opponents and remaining determined, focused, confident, in control under pressure. I can't think of one area of life that wouldn't benefit from having that attitude. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there are so many skills. I mean, when you're, when you're in youth sport, the majority of what you're being taught is life skills, how to share the ball, how to win nicely, how to lose nicely just basic communication skills and that things like t-ball and little league create that kind of atmosphere for learning about the world around you as opposed to how to hit a home run and then at some point it transitions into less life skills and more elite performance and i don't know if that's really the best way to do it i think that the yeah. life skills should be consistent throughout yeah and 
I apologize. I'm going I'm to pick on you for this one word, like this nicely word. I'm like, I don't know that we should have that at youth sport because I've seen this with a couple of my athletes that have come through um, who lack a killer instinct because they're confusing that they need, want to be nice. Well, I don't want to do that. They're going to feel bad. Or this is going to, you know, I don't want to run up the score on my opponent. You know, that's unsportsmanlike. And I'm like, well, where, are you, where are you getting this from? Like, you're going to let them back into the game. There's nothing not nice about giving 100%. Like, again, you're not doing something bad to them if you crush them by, you know, by shutting them out. Now, if you taunt them and you talk about their mother and you, you're doing all this other stuff, like that, that's unsportsmanlike. And we do want to teach that at youth sport. And we want that at the highest levels. But I would not want to be teaching my t-ballers to take their foot off the gas because of the score. I'm like, you have a job to do. And your job is to hit the ball and to catch it and to get as many outs. And it's neutral. It's not good or bad. It's your responsibility. So let's own that. Let's do that the best that we can. And let's be kind and let's encourage and let's keep that going. And let's respect our opponents, but let's kick their butt while we respect them. You can do both at the same time. So when I have some athletes coming in and, and even starters on the team, they're friends with all of them. They're like, they don't want to you know, get the ball too much because they want to be sure that everybody's participating. Well, if that's in a rec league, that's okay. If you're a ball hog, then that's probably a good idea. But if you're just doing it because you feel bad for Sally and Sally's really not that good, well, now you're doing that because you want to be nice, but you're costing the team because you should be taking the shot because you're all state. <laughs> and everybody, including Sally, wants to win. So... I want to be real careful about that, that nice thing at the beginning. Yeah. There's nothing not nice about dominating. There's just the way that you do it. And then if we do it in that way, then that sets up the pros for excellence from the beginning because you're teaching them a task orientation, right? Yeah, you're teaching I, them execute the skill. I guess I said nicely because when you're playing youth sports, some basketball leagues and soccer teams don't keep count of the score. So That's they're true, just, yeah. they're just playing to play they're not, they don't really care who wins or who loses. And so that's where I was, that's where I was coming from when I said nicely, but I guess <laughs> winning, winning or losing, you, you learn both of those skills in the same arena. Yeah. And I'm sorry for picking you on that. It wasn't no, you no, as much fine. as that. It, it, I just have seen so many athletes that get that confused Yeah, because of the language that we will use um, or because they'll say the first thing, well, well, the score doesn't matter. And in those leagues, and I think it's great if, you're introdu if, you, if you can have a league where you're not keeping score and you're not introducing competition, particularly for 13 or under in the developmental model, we know that you know, it's probably better to focus on skill development. But even then, I would keep it on mastery conversations. Um, and I mean, we all know that they're still comparing and stuff anyway, but you know, that aggressiveness towards, you know, I wanna get this right and the repetition, even if we're not keeping score, um, can still be had to, to as we said, keep that task orientation. Um, yeah, good, good, good question. Good question. So is, has there ever been an athlete that you've had a real either performance oriented or mental health oriented kind of breakthrough with where you tell them something and they go to implement it and they say, wow, thank you for this. I use it every time I do X, Y, Z, every time I warm up, every time I go out to play. Has there ever been an athlete that has come back to you with such a glowing review of something that you've told them that maybe you might not have even thought was that important in the grand scheme of what you were teaching that day? Yeah, actually, I've got three different answers to what you're saying. That, that one's loaded. This is good. <laughs> Maybe in reverse order. Sometimes it is funny because, as you might guess, I like to talk and I, I, I put a lot of things out there. And, and once in a while, they'll come back because every, every week I like to say, okay, what did you remember from last session? What did you retain? What really helped? And once in a while, they'll tell something that I just said it offhandedly. And that goes back to the idea of like, wow, like I don't know everything. I don't know you. Um, and I have to trust that. So, so it's, it's been fun that, and most of the time it's what I'm intending, but sometimes they're like, wow, that really resonated with me. And you can just see it. Cause especially if I keep talking like this, all of a sudden they'll be like, and, <laughs> and it's not that they're, they usually, I keep them engaged, but if they're doing that, I'll stop. And they'll be like, wait, wait, what you just said there was really, really good for me. And here's why. So, so in that aspect, um, have, do I have anybody that really stands out? Like, I, I'm so thankful that a lot of athletes just flooded my head because I, I, that happens a lot. And it's not credit to me. It's just that this sports psychology thing works. 
And sometimes I'll laugh because they'll come back and we'll have done an hour of this and I've this and they'll do it like say mindfulness and, and then they'll come back and they'll be like, wow, you know, this is really making a difference. And I'm like, why are you so surprised? You think I'm a, fa <laughs> and I'll joke with them, but I'm like, you, you had to test me? Like, you, you know, it's like I was like, I'm a doctor, you know, <laughs> we joke, but um, it's so fun because you see their innocence about it. And, and really, it's, it's humbling for us, too, as, as practitioners. Like, I've seen it go happen and work for 20 years. I know it. I don't doubt it. I, I know it like gravity. But this is the first time a 16-year-old is hearing it. This is the first time, you know, a 20-year-old college player is going to use this in some area of their life. They're going to have doubt. And so I've really dropped the expectation that they should believe me. I want them to test it. And in fact, that's probably the most important thing about what I do is that they are actually going in, testing their doubts, challenging what I'm saying so that the experience tells them that this works because I know it will because it's science. <laughs> like I trust every time I jump off a ladder, I'm going to fall to the ground because gravity is. It doesn't, I don't have to believe in it. It just is. So one story of, and I've got a number, but one that really stands out is a, 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 a volleyball player that I'd had a number of years ago who was really anxious, had some performance anxiety as well as some identity stuff that we had talked about. And um, really was thinking of quitting. And when I get these athletes, it's, I've learned it's a decision that I have to kind of help. Like, is it really in their best interest to quit? Cause sometimes it is, and I won't go on that tangent, but I didn't, that's not what I got into sports psych for. I thought everybody wanted to be excellent, but sometimes the environment is toxic or they're playing for somebody else and not themselves, or they've been in it their whole life and now they want to do something else. And sometimes helping them come to terms with like, they're more than that sport that it's okay to leave because they'll have a lot of issues if they're having that conflict. But in her case, I was like, hey, give me a couple of weeks because I get the sense that you still really love your sport. It was your senior year of high school. And I would love to help you overcome this anxiety because I think we can get you back to enjoying your sport and doing pretty well. She's like, okay, fine. So we worked together. Long story short, she did well. And, all, and after we had ended, I'll never forget the letter that I had gotten in the mail uh, just heartfelt that said, thank you so much. I was the starting setter. Um, we won our state championship and I almost missed this. Like if, if I hadn't come to see you, I would have missed this entire experience. Um, but through the skills that I've learned, um, you know, I was able to, to really bond with my teammates, have a fantastic year and, and end my career as a champion. I'm like, oh, like send that to Disney, right? Like, <laughs> Like, and, and I'll, I'll get that with some regularity, like, because somebody's crying in the first two weeks that I'm meeting them and, and within a month or two, you know, they're hitting their, their skills or they're, uh, they're just wondering like, yeah, this stuff doesn't bother me. I don't know why it used to bother me. And I just get overjoyed because now, particularly for high school and college athletes, I'm like, you got your whole life ahead of you. And, and some of them, they do, they, they come back, they're coaches, and then they're teaching things that I taught them when they were an athlete. That's fantastic because now I look at the ripple effect that this is having. So I helped one athlete who improved his, um, his performance and did well, but now he's a coach in that sport working at a high school and he's affecting, you know, 20, 30 athletes every year for the next 25 years because these skills are, are and the mindset is so important and we're, you know, this, that ripple effect is exciting. So yeah, I, got, I mean, I just love what I'm doing. I just <laughs> you just exude that you love what you're doing. And that's, yeah, what's, I, that's what's so fun to do these interviews because I ask, like, I prepare the questions and then we go into the pre-interview and we just kind of talk through your, your basic answers to my questions and I'll, I'll make some notes, which is what I've, what I was doing. And then I'll, it'll, we'll get to this actual interview and it, you just light up. Like the people that I interview just absolutely light up. They love what they're doing. They love sport. They love the mental game. And it's, it's so exciting. It's so exciting to have you answer these questions that, I mean, I've prepared. I, I feel like I know what your answer is going to be, but at the same time, hearing you say it with such conviction and so excitedly is really mm. awesome. And you know what? If I could tie it in to a question that you said earlier, it just, just came to me when you talk about the identity. So let's take us ourselves as consultants. I think the joy that you see in me and other people, I'm going to guess is because we are highly identified with our role. Like, like I will say, I am a sports psychologist, but I'm also more than that. And 
by not having to define myself by my athlete successes, right? By constantly giving it to them. If they win, they won. I, I, I back off. I played a role. It helps me because if they lose, they lost. I didn't miss or make those shots either. So we have to have that distance. But as long as I'm bringing my best self to it and I'm evaluating myself to a high standard, right? That's all important. But I am more than being a sports psychologist. My purpose, I believe, has been put on this earth to do what I'm doing. And it feels great to fulfill my purpose, but my purpose doesn't define me. I'm already defined. And then this is what I get to do. And I live my career that way. And I think that's why after so many years, you can still see the excitement of it because I get to do this and I'm highly invested and I, I, I care very much and attention to detail, right? So this isn't about if it's not everything, then I'm going to be sloppy. Absolutely not. But it won't ever define me because I have other things. I'm a father, um, you know, I'm a friend, I'm a CrossFitter, I'm a, you know, a weekend football player, I'm, uh, I'm honest, I'm, you know, whatever. And it's, it's important to have all those eggs in the basket. And I think, you know, bringing that link into if, if people are struggling with athletic identity, you want to kind of find out what else is in that basket too. Like, you, you get to do sport. Like, and you really, I, I, I want my athletes to have that same excitement and vigor that, that you're hearing from me about my career. And we really want to see that in our athletes. Um, Cause otherwise, why, why, why are you doing it? If, if you don't hold on to that. That's, yeah, that's, that's it's almost, it's almost infectious. It's infectious happiness when you as an athlete are coming to you as a consultant and you're saying, Hey, I want to get better. I want to be happier in my sport or in my life. And then you're met with you. <laughs> and it's like, okay, I know I'm in the right place. Yeah. Cause like, even as you do it, I want to be like, good, let's get at it. Let's <laughs> yeah. go. Right. Every day. Like that's a great goal. I, let's yeah. get there. Yeah. And I have to, sometimes I have to be careful about just not going too fast or too exciting. Like that's honestly been something that I've had to learn. That was the first thing I got in, in, in graduate school. I had that supervision. I'd get the supervised hours for internship or for certification rather. And I really was like, don't do all the work, Eddie. Like it's their sport. Like, you know, and uh, go at their pace. Like I can't be running ahead of them. Um, and those are just some, some important things to learn. So I'll, sometimes they'll keep it bottled up and I'll be like, mm, and they'll see it. They'll be like, what's going on? I'm like, can I, can I tell you something? <laughs> My athletes are kind. They, they, they <laughs> that's, that's so fun. So like, what's the difference between working with a youth sport athlete and working with someone like a junior Olympian because the mindsets like you were saying earlier with youth sport so you you don't I hesitate to say dumb it down but strip away strip away the layers and tell it yeah. to them as easily as possible what's the difference between the payback that you're receiving from these athletes um, well, again, two questions in that the payback I yeah. found is is not different like I love working with my high schoolers um, as much as the the pro athletes because in the end, what I found after my first few pro athletes and junior Olympians and national champions, I was like, wow, they're normal people. <laughs> they're just really, really good at their job. Like I've met some doctors who are really good at their jobs and some journalists that are really good at their jobs. I happen to really admire and can't believe like the freakish things that they can do physically. Um, but when you sit down and talk to them, they're normal human beings. Uh, you know, a quick tangent. So I, I ran track and went to high school with Puff Daddy. And this is how I first learned it. Yeah, I mean, you wouldn't expect that, but in the, I grew up in the Bronx and I went to school with Sean Combs. So when he made it big, I was like looking around like, what's everybody freaking out about? It's Sean, like, like, it's, like, it's Sean. Like, what's, what's going on? He even had that name in high school. And it, it was just amazing to see everybody flipping out about him. But then, you know, like, I love Will Smith. And I'd be like, like, I would love to hang out with Will Smith for a night. <laughs> like, I just, I love the guy. I think he's hysterical. And I would probably have a little bit of that, like, whoa, man, it's Will Smith. But I'm sure Will Smith is a human being too. And you learn that about the athletes. Tremendously gifted, hard workers. But when you get to sit down and talk to them, they're people. They've got families. They've got concerns. They have doubts. Um, they have goals. So the, the, the main difference that I would say as I go through the spectrum of, of younger athlete to, to more professional or is their level of investment. And that's appropriate. You know, you'll have people at the higher levels who are going to spend more time, more money, more energy, 
and more of their life sacrificing to excel. And that's where I have to really be careful with my high schoolers because there's a wide range. There are some that honestly are there and they're just there to have fun. Um, and that's what a lot of my like club athletes, the ones who are in like say a swimming club and then they go back to their high school team. The club is all about winning and because everybody's working equally intense, but then they have to deal with their, their, their high school team where half of them are, you know, they're just for exercise and friends. Some of them want to win and care about it. And a very small percentage are going to, you know, play or swim at the next level. And so there's so many different ideas of like, I don't want to do 20 minutes of imagery a day. Are you kidding me? It's like, I'm going to do my practice. I'm going to go home and I want to play PlayStation. Um, and so you have to navigate that. And that's, I think, maybe the biggest challenge between them or the difference that I see, um, which isn't to say that every professional is like totally invested in the mental game and doing it either. There's still individual differences. But overall, I have to, as I said earlier, gauge well, how much do I give? So I always ask for permission. I find out what's the main thing that you want? Session one, how will you know? This is a question I ask. How will you know that our work is done? How will you know that you've gotten what you came here for? And I got to get behaviors from them or you know, a description of an attitude or a consistency in a particular performance area. And then when we get there, I say, okay, you've gotten what you came for. Do you want more? I was like, because here's the menu of things that we could go. Like perfection is a long way off and we'll never get there, but we could always strive for that excellence. How, how much do you want? And then they give me the permission about whether they want to move, particularly if they came to me in distress. I'm like, you're switching, right? You're motivated now because you wanted to get rid of this bad stuff. And now you're happy. But there's a, the other side of it where like, are you hungry? Like, do you want the gold? Do you want to get better? Because now that's going to be motivated by a desire for excellence and hunger to be great, no longer to get out of distress. And that's a major pivot point. So that set up, if I've got somebody there, I have that very same conversation. And I'd say 50-50, some of them are like, yeah, let's get it. Like, this is great. Let's keep going. And the other half is like, no, you know what? I'm so glad that I'm not upset anymore and I'm having fun again. That's what I wanted. And thank you. I'm performing. Um, I'm going to get back to my life. It's like, I have to listen to their goals. And as individuals, they all have different ones. Yeah, I mean, I think that once you get to, to an elite level, like even playing in college, I mean, so much of it is about maintenance at that point. But that's not to say that you can't simultaneously learn additional things or additional mm -hmm. mindset topics. But once you get to a collegiate level, there, I feel like you're you're at an elite level already, and you understand you're you understand the process of striving toward a goal, and you right. understand what it takes to get there, and so now it's just maintaining that and then elevating that mindset as well. I like that word that you use, elevating, because you're right. Because there is a certain amount of maintenance, but in much the same way that you've been walking for x amount of years. And your, your, your ability to walk is different. Like when you're a toddler and you're making these mistakes, but then once you learn how to walk and you're walking, you can get better at walking. I mean, there's a sport of walking and how fast and how efficient you can be. Like, and most people don't, you know, you know, we train that way, but the power walkers. And there's another person that I've worked with. That was his collegiate um, sport, walking. Uh, I forget the distances that he had done. Again, amazing stuff. Um, but the point is, is that I, I do get to that where I'm like, okay, you guys have kind of graduated the elementary school of sports psychology, right? You understand the goal setting and the imagery and this and that, but now it's a matter of quality. And it's also a matter of an ever-changing context because the challenges you have in high school are different than the challenges that you have in college. And you're a different person. You've got different maturity and you've got different stressors and the stakes get bigger, which is then different from your club or then professional, et cetera. So sometimes it isn't Often, particularly if they've worked with me for a while, look, you already got the basics, but that doesn't mean that you know everything. You know, it's a constant refining and applying to, to bigger challenges. I, it's like a weightlifting example. Like I know how to do a bench press, but it should always be hard for the rest of my life. It should just get harder or rather the weight should just be, keep going up. I don't have to do it differently. I use the good form and I know how to do it, but I keep getting stronger because you keep putting on 10 pound plates. So struggling at, you know, at, at 150, then I should be struggling at 175, then I should be struggling at 200, right? And you can keep refining and keep going back to it, but it's a different lift when you get up to those higher weights. And I think the mental training or the sports psychology in the bigger context is very much like that. Um, you know, putting is putting. Okay, maybe, but on a putt-putt course is one thing. On a high school team is another. And for a million dollars on the 18th hole, 
do something else. <laughs> Same skill, but I think you better have more practice and development and strength of that skill to, to execute it. Yeah. <clears throat> That's that golf is a really good example because golf is such a mental game. I mean, it's one of the most intense mental games that exists because you can hit it hundreds of yards, but if you can't close, you're not going to win. You know what I think what I've found in my years is the most, um, I guess needs the most mental toughness or the most psychologically hard sport is it's the one that the athlete is playing <laughs> because every athlete has told me, well, this is why this sport is harder than all the others. And I'm like, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> and it is kind of true because I mean, they're all different and they have different challenges, but I, I honestly believe that I really have seen it. I'm like, if you're going to do anything at the highest level, um, the, the, the psychology and biology that it takes, like forget the, the specific demands, the process of it. Um, is just outstanding. So I've got equal respect for, um, you know, curling, for powerlifting, for golf. Um, it's, it's, I can't say that one is uh, harder or easier than the other. Um, if you want to be great, if you want to be a top 1%, it's crazy hard. So that leads to a, a new question. So do you think it takes more mental skills training or mental agility to get from 1% to 50%? or from 98% or from 97% to 98% of your potential in a sport? Well, it depends. I have like, I have more questions than answers. I, I think about, well, what do you mean when you say it takes more? So, I mean, I guess if I could draw this out, draw the piece of paper handy, draw the pen. <laughs> I think, and I don't know if this is true, so I probably I shouldn't even say this, but I think in general, when you look at like sort of time and improvement, I mean, don't most things go something like this? I don't know, can you see that? Yeah. It's yeah. like, you know, if it's new and you don't know anything, you're gonna get great improvement pretty quickly. And then the more time that you spend in it, your gains, because they're more refined and more difficult, you know, get shorter. And I think, I think it's proven at the Olympics. I mean, the difference between first and last in, in some events is less than a second. So those micro differences, you know, that extra five minutes of sleep a night that you're getting over your opponent or that hydration that you did that the other person didn't or that, that tiny technical turn that you made in the pool, you know, can be the difference between meddling or not. But to achieve that precision, took a year of practice. <laughs> so I think I would like to see that everybody's working equally hard, but you would probably see that um, how much work you have to put in for a, a grade of improvement, the longer you go, the harder it's going to be. And I think that that's sometimes why people exit because they're like, gosh, this is taking so much work and I'm not getting that much better or I'm not really seeing it as quickly as I did. And if that's happening, then they need to be really dig into the motivation and be able to appreciate the little differences in the nuance and the process. So I think that's the shift that's needed as you get uh, more talented or, or more uh, achieved. So how does someone work toward that elite mentality? So say they've just, they're on the Olympic team for whatever sport they're in. What is the first thing that you think they should do now that, I mean, it's been proven that they are in the elite of the elite. Is there one thing that you think that is crucial to be an elite athlete or more elite than you were before? Honestly, I don't know. Um, maybe, maybe it's a mindset shift or hydration or something more clinical is there one thing that you think is, is important above the rest? And that's, yeah, it may my, be proven, it may just be your opinion. Yeah, I'll have to go with sort of my experience. Um, I, I just can't help, but my head is screaming individual differences. Like I'd have to ask that athlete because everybody is so different with such different backgrounds and such different strengths and weaknesses. And sometimes I'll deal with athletes, for example, who'd be like, oh, well, 
you know, this, this basketball player is so lucky because, you know, he's 6'5". And I'm like, well, that might give some advantage, but I know a lot of people that are 6'5", and they suck at basketball. Like, it is, like it's, and it's been proven, right? Like, uh, Anders Ericsson in his book, Peak, The New Science of Expertise, says there's no such thing as talent. It's all about deliberate practice. Now, you can actually develop perfect pitch. And um, there's just story after story of it's the way that we deliberately practice and develop our skills. So, like, maybe that would be the thing is that, you know, you, by the time you're an Olympian or you're a professional or something, you've gone way beyond your physical talent. Like you can dominate in eighth grade if you're 200 pounds, <laughs> you know, and you've seen some of these kids, you know, who are really big and they can push people around. But it will always get to the point that your natural gifts won't carry you because everybody's great. You go to the NFL, everybody's outstanding. Like outstanding. And if you don't know how to work by the time you get to the NFL, you're going to fail really, really quickly. And so if you get a college athlete who has been kind of coasting and has just been, you know, maybe more naturally developed, I'm sure they work too, but, you know, has these, you know, genetics that are advantageous, he's not going to do as well. And that's why we have so many undrafted free agents that go to the Hall of Fame. I mean, there's not a lot of them, but they exist because of this principle of deliberate practice. So I guess maybe I do have an opinion in saying, like, you have to hold on to that and you have to stay hungry. You know, you can't, you can't settle in. Now that doesn't mean you should always be unsatisfied. I don't think that's healthy either. Like nothing's ever good enough, but the enjoyment of improvement, the, the, the excitement about the challenge of getting better in that positive aspect of it, like really being able to appreciate what you've done and how good you are, but the excitement of what you can do, like similar to, again, and bringing it back to us as sports psychology people, right? I'm like, this next project that I have, this membership that I have, Success Stories membership, I'm like, I want to scale that. And I'm excited about the impact, that ripple effect that we can have. You know, that's exciting. And then that's where the energy to, to work and to stay up late and to create these modules and to, to put this course together, right, is because the impact that it can have. And it's not about me or us or what we're doing, right? It's about, it's about what we can get done. And I think that at the higher levels, that sense of accomplishment and excellence um, that hunger, that, that I'm drawn towards something is something that keeps people on the, on, on the top. Um, because yeah, they're never satisfied, but that's different than, you know, people who are never satisfied. They're just grumps. Like nothing's ever good enough. Uh, you, know, I don't, you don't want to live that way. And I don't think you can excel that way. But if nothing's ever good enough, because there's always more to get, and I love the process, I think that, that most elite athletes would do well with that. That's All a, of us would actually, I think, <laughs> forget it. That's a great, that's a great answer. So you were talking about your course. Can you, can you give us a little sneak peek of what is inside that course? Yeah, well, there are two things. So I've got a course, which is the psychology of performance, um, how to be your best in life. And that's through the great courses. Um, and that's 24 lectures, um, 30 minutes each across everything in sports psychology. So it's been a great tool for people who are interested in sports psychology um, I actually re I used it to study for the license or not the, the certification exam. So I was like, I was like, glad to see that that was helpful. I had a couple of other colleagues say that it helped study for the exam. It goes over a lot of topics and it's, it's really built that if you like the science of it, so as a great course is course, it starts off with sort of what's the, um, the science say, but then I also have made it very applied and you'll know, give a lot of examples, of both of what I do in sessions with, with my high performers, um, give examples, tell stories and then apply it. So I've also gotten great feedback that, you know, coaches love it because it teaches them the skills to teach their athletes, athletes of all ages. Um, I remember a 70 year old who said, I wish I had this 50 years ago um, because I just can use all these skills in life. And so it really is intended to be, as I said, using sport as a metaphor, it's sports psychology and you'll get a lot out of it, but it's more than that. It really kind of helps you say, because we all need, as I said, that mental toughness, how do you focus? How do you deal with, we've got special topics on deal with injury or disordered eating and um, body image and burnout. Um, I've got a section on there for parents too about how to be the ideal sport parent. Um, what do you do when positive thinking doesn't work? Which tangent, if you go to my website, I've got a 20 minute video on that as well. Um, and that's for free, um, which is one of my favorite principles because as I had said, I was like, it's about what you do. It's not about what you think. So that's all at the great courses. Um, and then what I'm, my new project and what I'm working on is Success Stories membership. And it's an online community that um, I am building. 
And much like memberships, it's sort of like, it, it, it's a community that you get to stay in. And so they'll have modules and things that we, we, we teach, but it's also a group of people that you can interact with. And um, gosh, how do I even get to explain it? It's ultimately what everything that I've been talking about so far. It's just been able to put in a community of like-minded individuals. So I've got athletes in there. I've got some high level athletes and I have some everyday people, but we're using against sport as the metaphor of the idea of how do we overcome the obstacles that are getting in the way? Because between you and me, nobody's doing it perfectly, right? As good as we want to say that we're doing it, we can be crushing life. You could still get better. And this is what I'm saying is that, and there's always something that gets in the way. Like we all know how to set goals. We all know we should be focused. We all know positive motivation, but every day something moves us away from it because we're human. We have normal feelings that we don't feel like it, or it's hard. We've got doubt. We have insecurity. Um, consistency is a big topic that we talk about in, in the membership. How do I keep going? And, and so the membership ends up being a place where you can get support, um, constant encouragement, but also in addition more to that, the science and the steps and the, you know, maybe some worksheets or some, some lectures about how to keep going. So it's just, it's just getting started. I'm only in about my fourth month of it now. And so I'm still adding to the content. I'm going to relaunch it. Um, it's a closed membership right now, but we're going to relaunch it in February. I'm toying with the idea of, um, maybe making it an open membership so people can come in like when they most want it. Um, and just yesterday, I'm excited. I'm kind of stuttering because um, I got introduced and I bought this new platform. So it's going to be on a new platform that's going to actually tweak it according to what the stage that you're at. So it's going to allow me to give you more direct feedback um, rather than just going to a site that's got a bunch of content and you have to sort it out. Um, in January, just before I launch in February, it's going to be on this, this new platform. Um, that also is going to help, you know, allow you to type in a word like confidence and then go through all my material and bring out for you everything I say about confidence. So it's going to be this super site to be able to um, individually tailor the experience for you. So again, it, it's all coming. I haven't done it yet, but let's, let's talk again in, in March and uh, like schedule two hours because <laughs> I can't wait to, to, to have this going. So let's talk about the psychology of performance, how to be your best in life. Yeah. What, what's the process of publishing that and getting to the point where it was a publishable thing that you wanted to put your name on? It was actually the opposite of that. Um, so interestingly enough, it started, I think, with just my desire to put stuff out there, mental toughness in 60 seconds and stuff. So the Great Courses is a, a, a big company out in Virginia, and they've produced, I don't know, thousands of courses and they what they're known for they're they've been called like the netflix of learning um they, they before all this home learning and stuff got popular they were there and they were just leaders in the field um and what they do is they would recruit um what they call rock star professors you know people who knew their stuff from brown university and harvard and this and that um but also were very engaging and would go well in their presentations and then they build these sets and they're like okay do your course so one of their recruiters um, saw uh, a lecture that I had done on mental toughness, the X factor at, uh, at community college here in Grand Rapids. And uh, he just called me up and kind of said, Hey, we have this idea. Would you be interested? And I'm like, yeah, well, yeah. sounds like something I would definitely love to do. And they I said, okay, we'll put together a pilot. So I put together a 30 minute lecture on, um, on motivation and they flew me out to, to record it and do it. And, uh, and then they said, okay, we're going to send it to all these people and test it in the field and see if people are interested. And then I think it took a year or two. I didn't hear anything. And I was like, oh, like somebody emailed me and actually said, hey, I'm one of the reviewers. This is outstanding. I'm so excited. Can't wait for this to go. And I'm like, yeah, yeah. A whole year, year and a, I didn't hear anything. And I was like, okay, well, I guess not. Kept doing my life. And all of a sudden I get a call. Hey, we're ready to go. <laughs> okay. Um, they gave me the title. They said, you know, we're going to do it in this way. And then they said, uh, like, how long do you need? And I'm like, well, look, I'm not a professor. I was like, so I got to create everything from scratch. Most of the professors just take their stuff from their university and they do it in front of a camera. So I was like, I need a couple of years. And so it was a great sabbatical that I took. And I just dove in. I was like, I put myself through graduate school again. And this was just a blessing. So I was able to go in and I just put it together, the, the whole course of what I want, what I thought was important. So where I think it's different and I kind of put my stamp on it was that I do, I start off with, not the traditional psychological skills training, but section one is all about that acceptance and commitment therapy approach, the mindful approach, the idea that, hey, you have to make, you have to make peace with 
um, the adversity and it's your willingness to go through that in service of your values. Cause I think that's most important. And then the, the second quarter of it is about the traditional psychological skills training. So all the science about um, motivation and concentration and focus, et cetera. And then the third section is where it got kind of fun. I was like, well, what are the big issues that we have to deal with? And that's where I put in the perfectionism and I call it how to be the perfect perfectionist, which I, I love that. Um, and that deals with like, how do you handle your mistakes? Um, the burnout, uh, the injury rehabilitation, body image, substance use, and performance enhancing drugs. But the other one that I had added in there was self-compassion. Because we don't talk a lot about that, but in the literature, I was totally finding that if we would do more than that, you do more of it. How do you, like, athletes like to beat themselves up, let's be honest. I have, I have perfectionists that come in and say, nobody's harder on me than I am. And I'm like, okay, well, congratulations, but that, that's not great. <laughs> that's not gonna, like, that's not a badge of courage to be wearing here because you need to give yourself some grace. But what perfectionists can't stand hearing that because it's like, oh, you, you, oh, I take it easy on myself, I'm gonna lose my edge. And it's like, no, 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 no. You can hold your desire for excellence up here, but beating yourself up over a mistake, how is that helping you? How do you change that relationship? And the skills that you can learn through the course about self-compassion and the research that's shown about how people excel with that was, was great. And then the last quarter of it is more about developmental. So everything from youth athletes and how to be a good sport parent to I end it with retirement and how to be a, uh, an athlete, uh, an older athlete, making the modifications for a lifetime. And then when it was done, I was like, I love this. Like it's, and, and it's been such, the feedback again has been so great that there's really something for everybody in it. There's, there's enough science if you want to know that, but there's enough practicality if you want to use it for training. Um, if you're a student, you want to know the field, it's a great introduction, but each one is, is a 30 minutes of intense, you know, here's the, here's the literature, here's the science, if you really want to get into it. Um, and so I've just been really proud of it. And, but more than anything, you know, I get emails or reviews from people all over the world, different countries saying, hey, you know, thank you. This, this has made a difference in my life. And, that, and that's why we do it. That's really cool. So what other kind of sport psychology and also clinical psych um, outlets are you consuming? Is, are there podcasts? Are there books that you're reading? Are there shows that you're watching? Is it, are there articles? I mean, what, what, kind of, what kind of information are you consuming over what kind of areas to keep yourself in, yeah. this, in this space? Yeah. So, I mean, it varies. I, I really believe that you have to be a continual learner. And I guess depending on my stage of life and, you know, my commutes or other things like that, we'll kind of say, how do I, what am I dedicating it to? The big one is that I do attend the ASP conference just about every year. Um, I love the ability to kind of block out the rest of the world for three or four days and immerse myself morning, noon, and night in the best people in the world and friends and colleagues. And so having those individual conversations, but the presentations that they give, um, and being a part of that community. Um, I also belong uh, to a, a mastermind. So I've got uh, uh, five other sports psychology practitioners and we meet every other week and we just talk about business and sports psych and clients. And so it's a peer networking group. Um, and I'm in a couple of different versions of that. I've recently joined because I'm now moving into the entrepreneurial space. Um, I'm learning a lot more about how to do a membership site the right way and how to, you know, present online in the best way. So I've got a couple more business podcasts and, and memberships that I'm doing with that. And then whatever the big project is, is that I'm looking at the literature on it. So the books. So um, I, was, I started writing a book. And so now for the different chapters that I want in that, I'm reading books about the topic that I want to talk about. So I'm doing that. So books like, you know, Peak was one of them for the course that I had read. Um, some of them are just fun. Like I love CrossFit. So Ben Bergeron's book of Chasing Excellence was just one of the best sports psych books I read, but written by a non-sports psychologist, but he's trained world champions. Um, and then the story of the CrossFit games was interesting. So I get it out of there. Um, and then the literature, you know, so there that subscriptions to a couple of the academic journals. And so you go through and, you know, when you really get down into it, you want to find out what the science is saying. So it's kind of a, a mixture of all of them. Um, sometimes it's an audio book if I'm doing a lot of traveling. Sometimes it's before I go to bed. I don't know if I have a system, but um, it's definitely top of mind. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying. I have a bookshelf behind me. You can't see it. It's over my, my right shoulder, but it's full of books. I love reading. And I've begun to cultivate a bit of a sports psych area of my bookshelf. 
So uh-huh. I just, every time I bring someone onto this podcast, I ask, what are you reading? Because I want to add to my, my bookshelf as well. Yeah. If you haven't read Peak, I'd say that's, that's one of the ones that really influenced my career and the way I would do things. I think um, you mentioned that on our, our pre-interview. Probably. And then the other one yeah, that recently I liked was Atomic Habits. That's more of the more recent ones that I, I found very applied and, and really solid chapter by chapter. Yeah, you mentioned Atomic Habits, Chasing Excellence, Peak, and Struggle Well. Right, Struggle Well is the one that I'm about to, I'm about to finish that other book and get into that one. That's the next one. <laughs> but I mean, what, what do you think is the best way to get sports psychology across to the masses? Do you think it's podcasts? Do you think it's books? TV shows? I mean, is there a medium that you think is best to inform the world that sports psychology is something that is very important? The answer is yes. <laughs> um, and it's funny that you say that because that's really one of the things that, sorry, I'm going to tell you a secret. Like, so this is, this is my vision and my view of my life goal here. So I read the book, Good to Great, many years ago, and it's about how to sustain excellence in business. And they have these three intersecting circles. One is what are you passionate about? What can you be the best in the world at? And sort of what's your money metric? And it's that space that they all intersect where you can really become this outstanding, great you know, uh, company. So I was like, okay, well, I'm passionate about sports psychology and all the things in it. And, but where can I be the best in the world? Like, I don't know if I'm the best sports psychologist. I mean, I know people have been, you know, to like a hundred Olympic games and, you know, this or that. They've got, you know, all this experience. But I said early on, I was like, you know what I think I could do is I think I could be the best media sports psychologist. Like, I love this. Right. When we met, what was the first thing I told you? You have a podcast? Can I be a guest? Yeah. <laughs> but I'm available. Like, yeah. when? When are you available? Like whenever you want me to be like, this is a priority to me. And I love doing interviews and, and I've been on TV and the news, like any opportunity that I get. And if, if whatever my day is going, if I get a call from a magazine, I call them back. I'm a friend of the media. I call them back because I think that we have to be where people are. So if it is that people in podcasts, yeah, then we do that. If it's in the media. Yeah. If it's on TV, cause that's what they're watching. If they, if you can do a Netflix like special on my life, then by all means, let's, let's go ahead. And, which again, I wouldn't do that, but you know, whatever. And that's why I'm like, I love my one-on-one work and I'll never stop doing it, but I can't just do that. And that's why the idea of the course really sparked me because now when I'm sleeping, somebody could be watching that course and I could be helping them. And the same thing with the membership, like the membership could be, I mean, potentially, honestly, a million people. And how awesome would it be if a million people could consume this? So that's my mission for the rest of my life as it goes on here. It really is to say, when I went to graduate school, like that first class I said, and I was like, why didn't I know this? Why was I a runner in high school and college? And nobody told me this stuff. Now here I am as a senior in college and you're telling me there's something I could have done about this. Yeah. I could have run five, 10 seconds faster. I could have gotten over that block. And, and I was mad. <laughs> and he was like, well, why didn't anybody say this? Why didn't my coaches know this? And we're much, much better now because now I'm getting high schoolers and I don't have to explain sports psychology anymore. Most of them know. But at the beginning of my career, my first session was, okay, you're not crazy. This is what mental training is. You know, here's how it could help. It was a big sell job. But now, I mean, NFL, you know, NBA, Olympics, everybody understands that, hey, if you're not doing sports psychology, you're behind. It's no longer like get the extra for the cutting edge. You're behind if you're not training the mental game now, particularly at the elite levels. And so people do need to know this. And so the spokespeople, like the athletes that are saying it and saying it more publicly and the, the journalism that's going on about, you know, all like, I remember the last Olympics, they were talking about all the, the pregame nervousness and anxiety and then the sports psychologist role. When people win championships, so Stephen Hauschka, I'm a big Buffalo Bills fan, and I, I just about cried. So Stephen Hauschka was one of our kickers and um, he's recently retired. And in his Instagram post, he's thanking everybody and he put on there, he goes, a special thanks to you know, the sports psychologist that helped me you know, zero in and get past the focus and you know, become one with the ball. And it was just me and the ball. And, and I'm paraphrasing. He said it much better than I did. But the fact that he, he gave such credit overtly to the sports psychologist just normalizes it and lets you know, hey, this thinking and feeling thing, hard. Doesn't make sense. And actually, the stuff that we think does make sense is wrong. They don't follow what you think is right because there's something 
in there that's not going to lead you to excellence because excellence is weird. Excellence it means you got to do what everybody, what isn't normal. And we've got decades of research on how to do this. So why wouldn't you want a coach to save you all that pain from learning it on your own, if you even could? So yeah, I'm with you. Um, that's my life goal. I want to make it as accessible to as many people as possible and leave a, a big imprint before I die. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I started this podcast because I didn't think that there were many sports psychology specific outlets. Yeah. And even like I was looking when I first wanted to to start this, I was doing kind of market research and there's really nothing out there that is sports psychology specific. And so I think that just the fact that you and I are both podcasting and we found each other through ASP is so fun. Yeah. Because how many else, how many others are there out there like us that we just don't know about because we haven't put the connection together? Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Um, I know Sindra Kampoff has got one. I yeah. Mean, people you want to get in touch with. Yeah. Um, Justin Sua, I know, is crushing it on the podcast as well. Yeah. Mike Gervais has got, you know, that, that big one. I mean, there's, there's, so there's, there's definitely some out there, but you know, I like what you're doing here again, in the way that you're interviewing me, I'm imagining I get at least once a month, twice a month, um, a student calling me wanting to know about the field. And this I think is a tremendous resource because we're getting more and more sports psych students and they have no idea what the field is like, what it's really like. You can't really research that and know what it's like because sports psychology consultants vary, right? There's what I'm doing, which is very different than somebody who works with an NFL team, which is very different than somebody who works with uh, high school athletes in a school, which is different than a counselor at a college level, which is different than somebody in private practice. Uh, any number of differences. And uh, I think you're, you're going to do a great service to, to that population of grad students and people interested in the field to give them the, like, well, here's all the things that you could do and set them on their path earlier save them a lot of time. Yeah. And I think you and I were talking about this in, in the pre-interview, or maybe I was talking about it on that ASP Zoom. The fact that when I got to, like, I was a double major in, in college. And in my broadcast curriculum, there were so many opportunities to shadow and to do internships and to get out into the field. And then on the sports psychology side, there was nothing. I mean, there are yeah. no internships for undergrads. There's really no way to even know if you like the field, Yeah. which is, I think, I mean, I understand the process of you need to be certified in order to work with these elite athletes. But at the same time, what if you get your master's and you get certified and then you don't end up liking it? I mean, I think that that's, that's almost doing a disservice to the people who are spending four years with their bachelor's degrees not even sure that they want to go into the field. Yeah, it can be a challenge. And I think the availability of, you know, YouTube and videos and podcasts like this can change that. I guess I'm old enough going back into the day. I'm like, well, that's the way everything was. I mean, like, you know, the first time I saw a psych, like, how did I know I wanted to be a psychologist? I think I got lucky because it's not like I could ever sat in on somebody's psychology session and know what it looked like. Um, but to be honest too, uh, I don't know how many years I've been in practice, um, but I've never really seen anybody do sports psychology. So I remember Greg Dale came to our local high school here. And one, I was kind of mad because I'm like, I live here. Why are you flying this guy in? But anyway, he's high quality and good. So I went to his workshop mainly because I wanted to see well, what's everybody else doing, right? How did I get that far in the field? And I was like, okay, whew, like I'm, do I'm doing it right. <laughs> okay, but I just wanted to see somebody else doing sports psychology. And so I think that's, again, going back to the certification and uh, the mentorship and stuff like that, that they have now at a different level than we used to have is, is really good because hopefully you can get that, that earlier. But to your point, you're right. Um, the, the advice that I would give though, too, is unlike some other fields, I think that you can really create your own path in sports psychology because again, you've got kinesiology, exercise science, clinical psychology, you know, mental training. So we're not a narrow field. We talk about sports psychology, but the way people are practicing, I would advise people to like have some entrepreneurial spirit and have a business background because you're probably not likely to go pick up the newspaper and get a sports psych job in your neighborhood. 
you probably have to create it, which is great if you know how to do it. Um, but in that way, you can really kind of take this general knowledge base and then find out who do you want to serve. And then that way, you know, you will like it if you're able to create it. But that's a whole nother skill set and maybe a whole nother podcast. But um, yeah, I, be careful because there's so many different ways that people are doing sports psychology, so many different populations. Some people are really only working with the best in the world and others that are taking it and wanting to apply it to the general population. If you just look at it as like, we just want to get better in performance, you know, there's a lot that you could do with that. <laughs> So let's talk about being the best in the world. How did you get on the U.S. Olympic Committee Sports Ecology Re Registry? Oh, it's not really a very flattering story. I mean, really, the idea is um, it, it's, uh, it's by the USOC um, or USOPC now, U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee Sports Ecology Registry. And they're like, they just want to know that you've got the qualifications that you are, um, you know, ASS certified, um, a member of APA and that you have met the minimum requirements that they will allow you to work with the registry. So it's just a listing that says, okay, if an Olympic athlete wants to come see you, like you're approved. So it's, um, you know, that, that's about it. So it's like you fulfill the requirements, you do good work, and uh, I'm here to be a resource. You say it was unflattering. I think that that's a great honor. <laughs> um, well, I guess I just don't want to oversell it as an award or anything else. Like they, they really do want us to be like, um, it's almost not even like it's a qualification. I mean, I guess it kind of is because you are, um, you have to meet certain requirements in order to do it. So I am honored in that aspect of it. Um, period. So yeah, I guess I'm, I don't know. I want to do more. Like, that's it. Like I just, I'm like, I just want to give more. I want to do more. So, so we were talking about, about your kids during the pre-interview. What will make you move from Grand Rapids and pursue other opportunities elsewhere? You said that it was after your last kid graduates, you yeah. think that, that will be the, the catalyst that will allow you to move and follow other job opportunities potentially, or just grow your own brand. Yeah, and I would say that it's more of like, I don't have to get out of Grand Rapids. It's a wonderful city and a wonderful place. And, uh, you know, I do love to stay close to my kids. But, you know, when they're adults, um, and I've got my own life <laughs> to live, you know, I'm like, hey, if the Bills call me, um, I would love, if they don't win our Super Bowl this year, you know, would love to be a part of, of that championship. And I'm not going to limit it just to the Bills. But, you know, I love the NFL. Uh, if those opportunities came up, you know, that would be something that I'd be free to to pursue and, and, and do well. Like I'd have to accept it knowing that I could do well. But I'm really at the point too where I don't know where it'll leave. Like, you know, that's, that's you know, three years away. Um, and so who knows? I mean, if I've got a great membership, Success Stories membership, and I can just pour all my time into that and reach a million people, as I had said, well, that's incredibly rewarding. Um, so yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know if, it, if it's mostly online and, and products, then I don't have to go anywhere. Um, I guess I would just say that I'm open, you know, to what God is going to give me, you know, I don't have to control it anymore, which is good because I don't know that that was a good idea to begin with. <laughs> is there anything that I missed that you think that you want to either plug or get excited about for the future? Are there any questions that you think that I didn't touch on that you feel like I missed? No, this was actually really comprehensive. You know, I mean, I appreciate the time to kind of plug my stuff. So I think there's great advertisements, um, you know, there. And if you have the links so that people can find it rather than yeah. me saying it, then that, that works out really well. But I think you captured sort of the, the spirit of it all. I was glad to really be able to emphasize, you know, my philosophy of overcoming the adversity. That was what I said was kind of important. Um, and then, yeah, I mean, I, I felt engaged. So I think... No, yeah, I'm excited. I mean, like, I can't wait to get back to work this afternoon. <laughs> I mean, the worst thing is to create a question and answer atmosphere. So I try to, I try to facilitate conversation, although I do have a list of questions that I'm working from. Yeah. I mean, I love, I love the bouncing back and forth and the engagement between the two of us, because I would hear something that you hadn't mentioned in the pre-interview that I wasn't really prepared for that we just kind of tangentially went on. And I mean, those are my favorite interviews. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I hope I didn't like go on too long, but I remember you said you would just edit out. So I'm like, okay. No, you're good. You can take my five minute speech and cut it down to 30 seconds. That's good. Like, whatever. Thank you so much for spending your morning with me. Yeah, my pleasure. It's great to meet you and I hope to, we'll do something together again soon. I'll, I'll let you know when this is published so you can, and then I would also like links to everything that we mentioned, your, um, just everything that you've been working on that you would, that you think that listeners would be interested in. Okay. We'll do that. So you can just, you can just email those to me um, at any time. Okay. Very good. Write that down. All right. Fantastic. Thank you so Jane. much. Thanks. Best wishes. Bye.